Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. All right. Uh, my name is Kristen. I'm an alcoholic. And Fellowship of the Spirit Conference is dedicated to carrying the message of Alcoholics Anonymous as set forth in the book Alcoholics Anonymous to both alcoholics and family members of alcoholic families and Al-Anon families. The workshops is one of the ways we hope to share our experience, strength, and hope, focusing on the, for this one, the 12 traditions. Our next workshop will be focused on the traditions. Our panelists will each share for 10 to 15 minutes. And then uh, we'll open up to the floor again. And we we'll start with Kim, who's asked me to read part of Forward to the First Edition. The bottom of the page says, We are not an organization in the conventional sense of the word. There are no fees or dues whatsoever. The only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. We are not allied with any particular faith, sect, or denomination, nor do we oppose anyone. We simply wish to be helpful to those who are afflicted. Turn it over to Kim. Hi, everybody. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Kim. It's good to be here. It's good to be sober. Um, I'm glad it's a big book conference. My my sponsor used to say, if you want to hide something from a drunk, put it in the big book. Um, So that's for, I think, I don't know if anybody's been able to admit this. I'm going to see if I can, Francis will tell me the truth, but I think that's where (laughs) Al-Anon's put our money. Yeah, uh, so because they know we're never, look, never looking there. Um, I want to, I want just to aside before I get going here is I wanted to thank uh, Alan on, uh, especially Alan on speakers. I, um, you know, I've, I've I've been over conference. This is the first time I've ever you know chaired uh, this particular conference, and I've chaired other conferences when I lived in Kansas and other places and. You know, it was kind of a traditional AA conference, and we'd have an Al Anon speaker on one of the nights, and so forth. And and uh, a few years ago, uh, I was asked to come um, share on one of the panels, and it just happened to be the year. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, my sister died, and I, I came up there, and I bleh, just kind of let some stuff out and went off into the and and I really didn't get the full impact of the conference because I was uh, in my head a little bit. And um, th- since that time, I've come and, and participated in panels, but this time I've really had the opportunity to sit through all the panels, listen to all the speakers, and I have thoroughly enjoyed the Al-Anon participation. And I just want to, you know, say thank you and, and give you a hand from me to you and for any A's that are here. I think you just a fantastic job. <laughs> and the A's, yeah, you know who you are. <laughs> uh, Traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm glad a few of you showed up. Usually, uh, Kristen was going to tell the joke. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about traditions uh, on the next session, so we'll see you guys uh, at the banquet. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm glad a few of you showed up, stayed with us, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, when I when I got sober, I got sober in what they in, in Kansas City is where I got sober. I got sober in 1984. December 29, 1984, is my sobriety date. I'm very grateful for that. Um, and I, I left Salt Lake under the cover of darkness and, and uh, ended up in, uh, in, uh, in, in Kansas City. And, and a year after I landed, January 2nd, 1984, on December 29th, I was in a hospital with a tube up my nose going, what the hell happened? Um, and, and I will use a few uh, words of profanity, and I'm, I'm willing to be forgiven. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, 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 the story about that is, is I was at a, at a meeting uh, in Augusta, Georgia, where um, I'd gone to see a, a guy speak, and, and I was about two years sober, and there was a, a woman there had worked, lived on the street in Los Angeles as a, as a prostitute, and she had gotten sober and was speaking at the particular meeting I was at, and she, her language was very colorful. And uh, after the meeting, I was in the co- one of the coffee in the hospitality room, and there was a, um, there was a lot of, you know, this is in Georgia. Now, in Georgia, if you've ever been to Georgia, it's very, very, uh, they're very, uh, well, Christy knows this, you know, living in the South, you know, it's a, it's a very, use, use of profanity is kind of a, it's a bad moray. And uh, so in the, in the hospitality room, there's a lot of people using, you know, saying, oh, isn't that terrible the way she talked and this kind of stuff. And the, and the spiritual speaker on Sunday was, uh, was a guy named Paul, and he was a Cherokee Indian. And he told this story, and I, and I think it's worth, worth telling because, you know, I sponsor guys, 
Uh, I know a lot of people sponsor guys, um, and there's people that sponsor women, etc. cetera. Um, but the truth is, is that I can't sponsor some people. I'm not, there's no such thing I believe in a universal sponsor that, that speaks to everyone. And there's people that I can reach that some of you cannot. And there's people that you can reach that I cannot. And if those, if those of you that don't believe that, stick around and you'll see people that will come in and out of the program. And when they're ready, someone appears in their life and sometimes that match is made in heaven because it certainly isn't made here. And, and, and this, he tells the story of the Cherokee Indians and how their tribe picks their, their mate. And they go into the forest with an elder, kind of like a sponsor. And they go into the elder, and this elder teaches them how to survive in the forest, how to hunt, how to make their, ch- their clothes, how to prepare themselves for life. And in doing so, after a time, he teaches them one last skill, and that's how to make a flute. And he shows them how to put the, the, the holes in thing and make the different sounds and how to place the fingers. And he says, and your job now is to play a song. Learn a song, compose a song, and then bring that song into the, back into, into the village. And the woman you are going to be your mate will come out to greet you. And that woman will see that song is beautiful. And it will speak to her on a level that only she will hear. And I think a lot of times in Alcoholics Anonymous, there's some people that can only speak to certain people, and they will only hear that when they're ready to hear that, and it's a song that only speaks to them. So sometimes the language that we speak does get a little rough, and I've been known to do that, and I'm willing to be forgiven. (laughs) But I don't know how much that's going to change over time, but all I know is I've gotten better. But I don't apologize for that, because sometimes I'm telling you, there's sometimes certain words just fit just perfect. <laughs> and if you lived the way I lived, you'd understand that. And those are the people that, that I sponsor. The Oxford Group and the Washingtonians uh, were two of the early groups that, that we a lot of our information or customs came from. And if you read the, what, what Kristen read in the, in the Ford of the First Edition, you can see that a lot of the traditions of alcoholics now are embodied in either the first edition of the big book which was published in 1939. And in there it talks about non-affiliation and we're not a religious organization. And and the only requirement at that point was an honest desire. I'm glad they took that word out. I really am. (laughs) I didn't have an honest desire to do anything. Uh, I just wanted, I had an honest desire to get out of trouble and honest desire not to drink so much. But I don't know if I had an honest desire to do anything. But they modified a lot of the information and traditions came from the forward to the first edition. So if you read that paragraph, you can link a lot of those traditions to the traditions that were published in 1949 in the in book 12, tradition, 12 Steps and 12 Traditions written by Bill W. And that information was then taken to Cleveland and it was put in front of the group of Alcoholics Anonymous and it was ratified as the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. I spent a lot of time in my early days in the South with a guy named Charlie P. And Char, Joe and Charlie used to make tapes and I would go to conferences with Charlie and Charlie would talk about the do's and the don'ts. The do's were the steps. If you do these things as an individual with a sponsor and with a group, you'll get sober. You know, you'll do these things. The first step being the problem, the second step being the solution. Finding a God in your life, a higher power in your life, being able to, to get sober. And then 3 through 12, the action, the do's of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Conversely, the traditions, the first tradition is the, is the problem. Can we stay together? I don't know. I don't know about you, but we're kind of weird sometimes, you know. <laughs> and some of the people that I hang with are really weird. And when I, my sponsor met me, he didn't, he didn't give me, you know, the chance that I would make it. But, you know, we're normally people who will not mix and do not mix. And we come here and we try to stay together with a common solution, with a common problem. And that's not easy. That's not easy. So that's really the problem is staying together, the unity of Alcoholics Anonymous in the first tradition. And how do we do that? How do we do that? We do that through the second tradition, which is the group conscience. The group conscience. And the rest of those are the don'ts. Don't affiliate. You know, don't get into personalities. You know, have only one, have, have one primary purpose, a primary purpose for your group. What's the primary purpose of your group? Ask somebody what the primary purpose of the group, and they go, the primary purpose of the group, and they kind of quote that thing. But really, asking yourself, 
those questions about what is the primary purpose of the group that you are a part, your home group, is an important discussion that I've seen work beautifully well in taking a group inventory, when you really find out what your group is really about within the context of the fifth tradition. So each one of the traditions have been an important part of my life. And in this group that I came into in Kansas City, they were called a traditional group. Now, traditions sometimes get mixed up with customs. You know, for instance, that group, they never held hands. Don't hold my hand, goddammit. <laughs> Put your money on the table. We never talk about money in this group. You just stand up, throw your money on the table, and you say the Lord's Prayer. So that they saw that was a tradition, but in reality, it was just a custom of that particular group. This has nothing really to do with the traditions per se. So a lot of times when a traditional group, they're really the, kind of the staunch issues, it has nothing to do with traditions in my, in my experience. It's really more about the customs of that particular group. So the traditions are not customs, and they are not laws either. I don't know if I've, I've heard people that say, you know, we don't break the traditions in our group. And I've sat in meetings and listened to that, and they, they may not break them, but, buddy, they bend them good. <laughs> <laughs> they bend them good. There's other things that have come over the years that I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous and the traditions that almost sometimes even con, you know, conflict against each other. You know, the issue of us being an open society that anyone can join. I know one of the things that when I was first in Alcoholics Anonymous was the issue of the alcoholic addict controversy. There's even groups that say, you know, we qualify our members. You know, sit down. I'll tell you whether you're an alcoholic or not. And there's a lot of different issues that go on in relationship to that. But in reality, at the end of the day, being able to say that I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous is the only thing I have to do. I never even have to say that I'm an alcoholic. If I just say I'm a member, I'm a member, I cannot be expelled. So a lot of times when that discussion comes in a group that I'm in, you'll hear me say, my name is Kim, and I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because if I say I'm a member, I'm a member. And sometimes those overtones get us away from the primary purpose of this meeting, which is to carry the message to the still-suffering alcoholic. If we get stuck in some of these ruts in terms of really trying to you know, distinguish between the two so much to where we lose our primary purpose in being able to help the still-suffering alcoholic. You know, in my life, I've, I've watched these traditions work, and the, and, the, and the issues of some of the groups that I've been in and have been to, if they, they blatantly do not follow the traditions, maybe get into affiliation, which is one of my personal favorites, and get involved in other, you know, other issues or not other areas or affiliate themselves with another organization, there's nothing to be done. The group disintegrates on its own, under its own weight. So it's really, there's no police action that needs to be taken. We have no AA police. At least I've never met one. Well. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, sheriffs, deputies uh, of AA. But not, not really. I mean, but that's the nice thing about the traditions, too. They have enough in terms of people to have, really, to understand the traditions and where they come from and how good they've kept us out of trouble in the don'ts which are don't of, of the traditions. An opportunity to go GSO in 2003, and I only had about two hours there, and I went into the archives, and I, I was doing the normal things when you go to GSO, and if you haven't gone to the general service office, I recommend it. It's, it's fascinating. And I went into, and they have, they're digitizing a lot of this, but they had some large books that go against the wall in the archives, and you, get, you open them up, and there's a bunch of articles in there where you can see when AA was example, you know, they were in the newspaper all the time, breaking people's anonymity, you know, full page ad, pictures of people that had gotten sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. And they still have those pictures. And if you read through them through the years, and I only had a couple hours, I said, well, I'm going to come back and I'm really going to get into these. So the next time I was in New York, I took a day off from my job and, and took the subway up to uh, Columbia University and got off and went in and spent a whole day in the archives of, Al in, of Al Alcoholics Anonymous, the GSO. And I read a lot of this, and, and I noticed a pattern. And in that time, in that dark time, before the traditions really came a part of us, as you read the traditions, you could see that these people later on, these ones that had the full-page uh, pictures, draws, uh, sketches of them in, in these newspapers around the country, began to be saying, so-and-so, a reported member of Alcoholics Anonymous, died from alcohol poisoning. And so over time, these things came to, to be to the detriment of Alcoholics Anonymous.
So you really start to see why the traditions are the way they are about the anonymity and why we need to protect the fellowship because none of us have a guarantee that any of us, no matter how long we've been sober, how many meetings we go to, and who our sponsor is, and who we think we are, how many times we read the big book, big book the fact that we're going to be able to say that, in fact, that I can say I'm break my anonymity out there and represent this fellowship out there. I have this guy I sponsored for 23 years. I met him when I was lived in Georgia. And about five years ago, he got a, was in an accident, began to take pain medication, and, and a muscle relaxers, and eventually he felt so good he decided to go out and work some more, and he hurt his back again, and this time they gave him pain medication. Within six months, he was back out on the bricks. You know, this is one of the guys that has gone through the big book, one of the most staunch people that I've ever seen. He could quote the big book by chapter and verse and beat you over the head with it. And now he's struggling to stay sober one day at a time. What if he had broken his anonymity? What if he was such a sterling member of Alcoholics Anonymous, he felt compelled to say, I'm AA, I'm a representative in the public, in the press, on the Internet or on the web. So we need to protect this fellowship for what it is. And that's just the way I view it. Um, do the steps. Follow the don'ts. Now, they're not said as don'ts, but they certainly, if you read them and study them, they're not to affiliate, not to be involved in controversial issues, outside issues, etc. Okay, that's all I'm going to say, so Yahoo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was great. All right, next, uh, Bill is up. Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Bill. Hello. Thanks for uh, having me. I was actually volunteered for this, so I can't be responsible. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, uh, I, uh, um, the traditions, I, uh, I have never spoken on any traditions yet in Alcoholics Anonymous or in any conference level. Uh, I've, I've been taken through the 12 traditions of AA by four different people out of a book. Uh, once was, my first time was through, uh, AA Comes of Age, my, uh, second sponsor. And then I went through the 12 and 12 twice and then once again in a, in a group environment. And, uh, I have just always thought I'd never had any personal experience with them. And, uh, I went to, uh, this conference, um, I think it was three, maybe four years ago, um, in Colorado, uh, the Fellowship of the Spirit, the original one. And there was a couple guys, uh, from Indianapolis that did a workshop on the 12, uh, 12 traditions. And I think that was the, it changed the way that I look at the tr traditions. Um, when I first um, came to Alcoholics Anonymous and went through the steps with my first sponsor, he didn't have any experience with the traditions. And he believed the 12 and 12 was an essay book, and he didn't think the traditions were all that important. And he was sober 16 years at the time, and I was, n I was newly sober. And... Uh, so I thought, well, that's one last thing I need to learn about, one last thing I need to do. And uh, I just didn't know, you know, honestly, I, I didn't know. And uh, I just, I started getting involved in AA, and I uh, was nominated, I think, as GSR to a group, and I started getting involved in service. And then I started thinking that the traditions were something that we used that were rules, and that was how you kind of negotiated your vote or your way through service and in AA, and became an active service member, and uh, that was not true either. Um, but that was my experience, and that's what I uh, thought at the time. And um, slowly, um, the more that I have uh, tried to practice these, I have found that they are as important uh, as the steps. Um, and I wish I could share with you the way those guys did at that conference. Uh, there was one guy that did, they went through the traditions um, in the group level or the traditional level. And then the other guy did it on a personal or a relationship level. And um, I've tried to apply those in my life the way that they shared about it. And um, the last time I went through the steps was with my sponsor, 
who's here uh, analyzing everything I say right now. Um, <laughs> and he kind of did it both ways. And um, I, I, I'm grateful that, to have the experience, and I'm just I'm terrified that I'm going to screw them up. So uh, I'm going to read them part, as part of sharing my experience. Um, but I will tell you, um, I never had any idea of how ununified and how much how self-centered I am in this world. I mean, <laughs> the traditions, uh, in my experience, are about unity, me connecting with the world. I mean, not just in AA, but at work, uh, at the grocery store, uh, just on the street, getting coffee, whatever. My son, you know, um, it's more around me than I know, and these uh, traditions are... Uh, Basically, they're principles by the way I can I can live and try and be in unity with people around me. And I have to do the steps to be able to do the traditions. I will tell you that. I have found. i got to get out of here before I can even look at this stuff. But um, I'm just going to read. And I apologize. You know, as, and I was doing part of my 11th step. I was meditating on this and praying, God, help me. You know, what the heck am I going to say? You know, how I share I, I, I'll flip flop between short form and long form, uh, because some of them make sense more to me than the other way. Um, so, anyways, um, the very first or first tradition, short form says one: our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity, and uh, what that reads to me and the experience that I have with that is: am I really dedicated to AA? You know, am I just showing up here? You know, I walk in the meeting five minutes late, listen to, try to get something out of the meeting, suck everything that sounds good so I can, oh yeah, that's what I need to do. And, uh, drink some coffee and, and leave. Um, or, you know, what kind of, a, of an example am I setting in Alcoholics Anonymous? You know, am I really dedicated? Do I really believe that this is a matter of life and death for me? You know, am I, do I believe I really have alcoholism? Is this where I, I, uh, uh, hang my hat, I guess you'd say. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, ever since I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, I came into AA when I, I think it was May May of 97, and uh, I went to more meetings I've ever, ever gone to in my life. And it wasn't until I sat down um, and went through this book for the first time with my sponsor that I felt like I needed to do this, that I felt like my life was on the line. Um and I was taught, without him even knowing it, I don't think, he was teaching me a lot about these traditions. Never say no to an AA request. Do what you say you're going to do. Um, be on time. And uh, I don't think he knew it, but he was uh, his the guy he called his sponsor was the found, one of the founders of the Fellowship of the Spirit in Colorado, uh, Don, Don P. And uh, Don was just so effective in doing all this stuff and talking about this stuff. I think he influenced more people without even knowing it. You know, they didn't even know that they were talking about it. But uh, I, uh, I've just, I was given that um, kind of that conscience, you know, how do I look in AA? It's not just about whether or not I go to a meeting. It's how do I look? What do I do when I go to a meeting? And uh, am I doing what I commit to do? You know, if I commit to make the coffee, if I commit the chair, if I uh, commit to be the greeter, you know, this is serious. And, uh, Fortunately, I'm just sick enough that I believe this is serious. If I don't do it, if I try and skimp, I get really nuts. And uh, I don't like feeling that crazy. Um, then I'm going to, I'll just, I'll move along. This is going to sound really unorganized. Uh, short form of tradition two, uh, for a group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Um, I learned uh, through, I'm in my fourth home group. Uh, I don't feel like I don't, um, I'm not sure about that. Um, our group conscience is not just a vote. Um, we don't just sit down when we have a group conscience meeting and, okay, should we do this? Let's vote on it. Um, it's almost more of a living, uh, breathing thing. We're, we're, connected uh, in a way that we all believe in the purpose of our group and what we're doing. And so when we do vote, it's more of just kind of a confirmation of what we're going to, what we're doing, you know, and I think it's because we try and uh, give everybody in our group a, a voice uh, 
in the you know in the group conscience and uh we all none of us you know no, no one's in charge uh our god shows up when we uh, get together and we talk about you know working with other alcoholics um and it's just always been uh that way i've been really fortunate to hang with some really good people in alcoholics anonymous um I'm going to move to the long form of tra- tradition three. Three, our membership ought to include all who suffer from alcoholism, as we may refuse none who wish to recover. Nor ought a membership ever depend upon money or conformity. Any two or three alcoholics gathered together for sobriety may call themselves an AA group, provided that as a group they have no other affiliation. Um, I think I've talked to three people this week and about, I think, this tradition, you know, Affiliation, you know, we're this conference is not an AA group because we're affiliated with Al-Anon, and this conference was founded on the theme. Our mission statement is to carry the message of recovery out of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous to alcoholics and family members or people in relationships with alcoholics. Um, it was founded to bring recovery as a family, recovery as a family, and recognizing that this is a family disease, um, and uh, probably gives me goosebumps my mom sitting right over here the feeling to uh, share in a common um, way of life and a common uh, recovery is a powerful thing in my life and uh, it was uh, it's you know my recovery was one thing but to see my I have a brother that's really active in AA Uh, my mom's really active in Al-Anon I have a sister who's kind of hanging around here (laughs) uh and, uh, you know, when we get together, we, we come to this conference. This is, uh, a, I, I've always been really, uh, grateful that this thing exists and that most people in Colorado, uh, the Al-Anon is as important as the AA. Um, and the focus is still on the big book. And, uh, I just, you know, that's always been inspiring to me. I've met, because of that conference and the people I've met in this conference, I've met some Al-Anons that are more s- solid. <laughs> intimidatingly more solid on the steps and the traditions than I am. I mean, just like, wow, you, and you never had a problem drinking. You know, you, you know this about us? How do you know this? You know, and I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really cool. And I, uh, I just see the recovery and the growth that our family has made and, uh, the unity. And I, you know, I'm, I'm grateful. And that's one of the reasons that I really behind this conference, um, Let's see, I, uh, I'll move on to the short form of four. Uh, each group ought, should be autonomous, except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Um, I think one of the things I've always admired about uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is the char- different character that each groups have. I mean, as long as I don't feel comfortable in a meeting if it's not uh, focused on the singleness of purpose. I, I don't know why that is. I don't know if I was brainwashed through the book as to what alcoholism is or with, I, I just like feeling like I'm with my people, but different groups that are focused on um, alcoholism and uh, recovery. I've always liked, I'll go to a meeting on this end of the valley uh, and I'll hear the recovery program of Alcoholics Anonymous and I'll see it, you know, like Rob shared earlier and Aaron, their group down south is as focused as my home group or Kim's home group. Uh, I love that, and they all have a different character. You know, they, like Kim was saying, if I went into some meetings, I wouldn't feel like I belong, even though we're talking about the same thing. But I go to another group, and it has an entirely different uh, uh, character to it. And uh, again, uh, and five really goes along with tradition uh, four for me. As long as the focus is on uh, recovery through working with others, and uh, once we take these steps and uh, we practice this way of life trying to carry this message to other people and help them find recovery. Uh, I, I like the diversity. I, I, I like the character in the different meetings and the autonomy. Um, short form of six, um, an AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Um, the, the, one of the first things I was ever told by my first sponsor in 97, he said, uh, I told him all this stuff I had learned in treatment. I went through a treatment center probably at the same time Christy did. He was talking about her treatment center in 91. I think I went through in 1990. And I told him all this stuff about how when I graduated, they lifted me up and they had this Bette Midler music and they rocked me and then they (laughs) moved me over to the light. 
and <laughs> everyone was, it was really bizarre, but honestly, I think they were trying to create a spiritual experience in me with this music, and everyone gathered, and it just, as I look back, they kind of missed the mark as to, you know, what I had. I was just, I remember laying there on all these hands. I was thinking about, you know, stage diving, you know, and concert, rock concert. They were holding me up, and I was like, this is, there's something wrong with this. You know? <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I was telling my sponsor about all this experience, and I told him how much of meditation I'd learned and how uh, this is this and that. He goes, yeah, all right. He said, uh, that's not AA. It's not AA. You know, and he uh, said, this is for fun and for free. How much did you pay for that? I said, well, actually, I... I owe my mom a man. She paid for that treatment center. I never paid for it. And actually, I've never paid a dime for that treatment center. Her insurance paid for it. Well, somebody paid for it, he said. Well, yeah, somebody did. The insurance company paid for it. But uh, I've got to make amends for this, you know. And there was a $21,000 charge, and it went through court. And you could ask my mom exactly what it ended up being. But um, he said, well, this is for fun and for free. The only reason I'm doing this with, for you is because I want to stay sober. You know, this is for fun and for free, and uh, I'm not going to charge you a dime. Uh, there's no money exchanged here. I do this so that I can stay sober. And uh, uh, there's no uh, – that that was the first thing I, I, I said, and I thought back over those the time. I remember the counselors, um, they had a vested interest in me, but it didn't feel like they were genuine to me. I mean, it was it, it was their job. Not their life on the line, I guess. Um, anyways, that's just my experience. Um, uh, long form of seven. I, I don't know how much time I'm taking here. I'm gonna. The AA groups themselves ought to be fully self-supporting by the voluntary contributions of their own members. Um, I'm gonna skip to the very. And experience has often warned us that nothing can so surely destroy our spiritual heritage as feudal disputes over pro- property, money, and uh, authority. And uh, we had a recent experience at my home group. We, there, these two brothers came to our home group, and they've been in our group for about a year now, and uh, they have changed. And they live with their parents still. And uh, their parents are very grateful. They've seen these guys change. And we, we, my group rotates. Uh, we answer the central office phones uh, once a month, and we go to somebody's house. We transfer the phones over, and then we answer these this hotline. And we have food. And anyways, we they had it at their parents' house, and their parents met us all, and just loved us. And they said, "Oh, we're so grateful. You know, you guys have really saved our kids, and uh, we want to pay you back. What can we do? Uh, noticed your uh, coffee pot sold. Can we get you a new coffee pot? Can we get you some food? Can we? Uh, how about if you guys come over and do this every week? We'll pay for everything. You know and I don't know if I was brainwashed again with this whole thing, but every time somebody outside of AA or a parent or um, somebody that's not an alcoholic comes up with money, I, uh, I it doesn't feel right to me. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've seen problems happen in other areas. I've never had any personal experience, but I do know that until I was self-supporting myself, <laughs> um, I don't feel well. I don't recover from alcoholism. I feel like I am unworthy. I feel like I'm not recovering. And uh, there's just something about that that has always uh, been in my consciousness. Um, am I doing all the time? Okay. I'm going to move on to long form eight. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional. We define professionalism as the occupation of counseling alcoholics for fees or higher. But our usual AA 12-step work is never to be paid for. And I have never tried to charge anybody for 12-step work. I just always thought that would be interesting to see what a, guy, a new guy I'm sitting down with would say if I said, "Do you have the 25 bucks on you?" You know, we're, we're going to sit down. I'm, you know, my son's in the other in the other room with my wife, and they're they know you're here. They're trying to be quiet so that we can do this. <laughs> I I don't know. Anyway, I yeah. Uh, I'll and and. I'm getting off the the subject of unity. All I really have is my story um, and my time and uh, what AA has done for me and what I believe God has done for me comes as a result of me doing those things. Um, 
the sacrifice that I make for AA is far less than what it has given in return. And uh, I'm really aware of it when I sit down with somebody new. Um, and sometimes it's a, you know, I, I really like a speaker from, I think it was Colorado. He said uh, the uh, coffee was the most thankless job in AA, and that's why he always liked it. And I know Kim has said that before, because you don't, nobody notices, you know, like, who made this wonderful coffee? This is delicious. Let's go say thanks, you know. Uh, I was sponsoring a guy once, and he uh, he was making the coffee for our home group, and he left the group on in resentment because somebody said that the coffee sucked. <laughs> anyway, I don't know if that was the whole reason he left AA, but he had that resentment. And then the next guy said, "I'm at our, our, our uh, business meeting. The guy that got voted in, he said, I promise I'll do a better job than this guy." Um, and uh, I don't know. Let's take that for what it's worth. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, he feels all right. I don't know. Um, anyways, uh, on to t- <laughs> uh, the long form of nine. Uh, how long is nine? Each AA group needs the long needs the least possible organization. Rotating leadership is best. Um, this obvious. This it seems like AA excels at the lack of organization a lot of times to me. Um, and there's a lot of things in the course of this conference that I've noticed. Uh, we have a lot of growth to do. Um, and, you know, I there's certainly a lot of growth uh, in my life for um, organization. or um, that We have to have organization so that we can stay uni- unified, I think, as a fellowship or even as a conference and at, in my home life. But making it... Uh, uh, cookie cutter thing and uh, everybody doing the same thing wearing the same clothes if you guys are like me that totally makes sense I wouldn't probably be coming here if I had to wear the same shoes and clothes you guys wore um, I believe the uh, spirit of rotation is uh, this is just my experience it's mandatory to preserve the unity um, that we have um, I, uh, I, I think I chaired a meeting for about two years and uh, start, people stopped going to it because they didn't like me, <laughs> and they thought I was in charge. You know, I, I was told, "Oh yeah, you're the guy that's in charge of that meeting." No, I'm I'm not. I like I like to feel like I I uh, have authority, but I don't want to uh, take credit for it. Or excuse me, I want to take credit, but I don't want the responsibility for it. And if I don't rotate, uh, if if our group doesn't rotate uh, our leadership. Uh, we don't grow. I, I've noticed uh, that's, that's really important. Um, power and control is just uh, way too harmful, I've noticed, uh, in AA. I'm going to, let's see, yeah, long form of 10. No, no AA group or member should ever in such a way as to implicate AA express any opinion on outside controversial issues, particularly those of politics, alcohol reform, or sectarian religion. The Alcoholics Anonymous groups oppose no one. Concerning such matters, they can express no views whatsoever. Um, if I have an argument or a discussion at work about politics or religion or re- relationships within the workplace, it's, it can get really violent really quick. And I've noticed uh, a lot of us have very heated, dug-in opinions about those matters, especially alcohol reform. Um, I think that was pretty clear. <laughs> um, I'll just share a story. I, I, I had an issue with, I can't remember what, I think it was a young people conference or something, and I, I talked to my sponsor about it, and he goes, well, why don't you call GSO, see what they have to say about it. And uh, I called GSO, and they said, well, we neither endorse nor oppose anyone. Uh, while these young people groups are uh, not alcoholics, we, we support them, and there are AA members in that, and... Uh, to protect, the guy ended the call. He said, "Well, to protect our fellowship, and to uh, remember how he said, preserve our unity, we neither endorse nor oppose anyone." And uh, I always have thought about that. You know, resentment is our number one offender. If I'm endorsing um, a candidate for uh, uh, for a presidential office or a sports team, even for that matter, I'm talking about it in a meeting. And there's a new guy there that uh, it has nothing to do with alcoholics or alcoholism. It's on the other end. Um, resentment that I get when somebody is, is against me will drive me insane. And uh, I, I believe uh, 
it just doesn't belong in AA. And that's been my experience. Um, almost done here. Long form of 11. Our relations with the general public should be characterized by personal anonymity. Um, Kim talked a lot about how it used to be. Obviously, we've grown quite a way. Um, my anonymity before I, I got active in AA, um, I was anti-AA. I came to AA when I was 19, and then I relapsed. And uh, I used to say things like, see, AA doesn't work. And there'd be a celebrity on TV, see, nah, AA doesn't work. Stay with us. We're, we're your friends. And uh, I remember saying, if that's what AA is all about, I don't want to be like that. You know, they're... They're losers. And, uh, no, it's, uh, uh, I can't be the representative for A. In the really quick long form of uh, 12, um, guy that spoke uh, last year at this conference, uh, he used to say, I'm an ant on a log going down a river. Um, I only think I'm steering the log. And uh, when I uh, am in unity with God and with you guys, I'm not trying to steer the log as much. And uh, there's nothing like the feeling of feeling like I'm on, a, I'm in the stream of life. And uh, these traditions have uh, certainly helped me in doing that. And uh, way, probably way over time, I'm going to pass the time over to Francis. That's all I got. Thanks, guys. I actually have an equilibrium problem, and I've had one for about probably about 17 years and um, have done really well with it. But about a couple of months ago, I started having trouble again, and, and I wasn't really taking care of myself, and that's why I fell, <laughs> because I was having trouble with the equilibrium. Anyway, but I'm here. It happened after I spoke, and uh, my name is Frances, and I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon. You know, um, my second sponsor is the sponsor who got me into uh, service work, and I started in the al Information Center. So while you were all up doing com- conferences, I was taking calls in the, co- the Information Center, and I'd read a lot of literature, and I really didn't know about conferences. But later on, I realized that, you know, I was the one that was doing the service work while you were having fun. Um <laughs> So they have this saying in Al-Anon, and I don't really care for it. They, they say, <laughs> my qualifier, um, you know, I think it's real codependent. But I have three qualifiers, me, myself, and I. And uh, if you've ever been to a district meeting in Al-Anon where there's a, lot of, there's a lot that goes on there, you need the traditions when you're there because of me, myself, and I with everyone. We have a hard time making decisions. And uh, so, you know, we really need the traditions. We have to keep, I had to keep thinking about traditions when I was in those meetings at the district level because of that reason. We just could not make a decision sometimes of like, come on, you know, beating a dead horse into the ground. Um, But, you know, this is not a me program. This is a we program. And so, you know, this isn't about my ego. When I'm doing service work in the program, I really have to bring God into it. And I believe that the traditions always point me back towards the steps. And the steps always bring it back to me. And, you know, what is my responsibility when I'm in service work? So, you know, I pray a lot and I meditate a lot. I've done it for the last couple of weeks, maybe three weeks. I've been been in a lot of prayer and meditation about speaking yesterday. I was really um, had some fears about it and, and just prayed a lot about it. Um, God is important. You know, God is, he's the um, the one in charge when it comes to putting something like this together. And um, so Thursday morning, I have a little granddaughter who is five years old. And last February, she had a series of seizures one morning and ended up in the hospital. And so Thursday morning, she hadn't had one since last February. She had a seizure. And uh, that's quite, you know, that takes your program to a whole new level. So, you know, I was thinking, okay, now <laughs> we're at the hospital, and and I'm thinking, you know, I, I had all this stuff I was going to do before I spoke last night. I had done prior work and had been in prayer and meditation, and, you know, through the night, I didn't sleep because I was 
wondering if it was going to happen again, and if it did, if I was going to be able to make it, you know, all that stuff that goes through your head. Um, God hasn't taken care of, of all of my defects of character, or I would have slept that night. And then yesterday morning, my daughter, this summer, she's had a lot of health issues, and they don't know what's wrong with her. So we were up doing an MRI, and so I had to really work on, you know, talking to God yesterday, like the second tradition says. You know, I had to bring God into this. I had written a lot, but I I know that it doesn't matter how much I write or how many notes I put down for speaking, it's going to be God's will, not mine. So I have to do that because that takes my ego out of it, and it makes me humble. And it makes, you know, me being able to be here last night possible. So um, God is our authority. Um, You know, we have to let go of outside influences. I did this through a sponsor early in the program. I remember I showed up at a meeting with the 10 steps to success. (laughs) And uh, Louise said, Francis, can I borrow that from you? Those are really interesting. She was an old lady. She had gray hair at the time. Anyway, she might have been as old as I am right now. Who knows? Um, anyway, um, so she, I lend them to her, and uh, she never gave them back. <laughs> and, you know, that was a strong message, Francis, you know, outside influence. You're not going to bring stuff into this program that's not Alan unrelated. And, you know, we do. There's a lot of outside things that come into it. But she was just trying to teach me something. Um, let's see. It's a simple program. You know, I I believe in autonomy in my relationship and my marriage with my family. Um, I believe that, you know, we don't, if if we're autonomous, we're not going to be enmeshed. You know, we need to have our autonomy. I think it's really, really important, and that's in our traditions. Um, uh, You know, one of the things, we can't 12-step our own children. That's one thing that I've learned. We cannot 12-step our own children. In Texas, they have this saying, you take good care of my children, and when your children come into this program, I'm going to take good care of your children. And, you know, I've had that opportunity this last year. I got asked um, to be a sponsor of a young lady whose mother's in this program, and I remember those words, you know, I'm going to take good care of your your children because I hope that you take good care of mine. Um my, you know, we're supportive of our children. You know, I, I try to be a good example. My daughter had a baby at the age of 17. And uh, her, the baby's father and my daughter, they were home. They came home. They brought that baby home. And what I did is I made a rule. Rather than try to twirl stuff, I made this rule about trying to get through um, having those kids in my home with a brand new baby that in the middle of the night, if the baby didn't cry longer than 20 minutes, if the baby would cry in the middle of the night, I wouldn't get up unless she cried more than 20 minutes. And, you know, it was really wonderful. She never cried more than 20 minutes, and I never had to get up in the middle of the night because I always took care of, you know, that problem. So, you know, um, that's the way that I start to have, you know, I can work my traditions with my children by not trying to um, tell them how to work pro- or tell them to be in this program. Um, I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> I've been a little rummy. Um, you know, I believe that we need to work with AA. AA, if it wasn't for AA, we, Al-Anon would not exist. And I, I have a real difficulty when I hear when Al-Anon wants to separate from AA, you know, when they want to do things differently. You can't have family healing if we do not cooperate with one another. And, you know, I, and I've been in the program for more than 25 years, and, and I just see, you know, I hear it a lot, both sides. And, you know, if you want to have family recovery, we must cooperate with one another. And so this is a beautiful deal here. I, I love this convention. It's the first time I've been to a, a FOTS convention, and I think it's really, really well put together. Um, let's see. I think that, the you know, these are just a simple... These are guidelines for our group, you know, for our groups, and for service. Um, I was an Alateen sponsor for a long time, and Alateen is not preventative medicine. I heard that from an AA, an Al-Anon speaker, about 18 years ago, and you know I've thought about that. I went to be an Alateen sponsor, and you know I was taking care of 
you know, your children and mine. And um, I learned a lot. You cannot make Alateen when you're a sponsor. You can't make it your meeting. You know, you don't get to go on there and ch- share about your personal experience. You're sponsoring these these teenagers, and what you're doing is you're going to... I had to sit in those rooms and, and just try to keep... Control, well, you know, for about 40 minutes, you just control. You know, you're just trying not to lose your mind because they're throwing down chairs or, you know, spitting spitballs across the room. <laughs> you know, I'd leave those meetings sometimes, and i think, oh, I'm just not going to do this anymore. I'm through with Alateen. You know, I'm not... Uh, and then the next day, they, you know, the next meeting, they'd be angels. They would just be perfect angels. And I'd say, okay, God, I'm, I'm still here. But, um, you know, you just, I had to, when I did my service work as an Alateen sponsor, I really had to keep that clear within myself, that this is not my meeting. It's their meeting. And uh, they became really good teachers. You know, I got to hear a lot of things about what we do to our children and, and got to think about a lot of things. I did it for six years, and uh, we had this incident one time where we had a little guy that uh, wanted to take control of the meeting. He was a secretary, so he had all the numbers and the names of all the kids in the meeting. And, and this little guy, he would call everybody every week, and he actually start, you know, he would kind of set the tone for the meeting. It became a big problem, and um, finally he decided that we weren't doing our job right, and he went to the district. And he said, you know, he complained about us as Alateen sponsors. So we did. We had this big, like, come to Jesus meeting with the district. And they took him aside, and they listened to his side, and then they took us aside, and they listened to our side. And then we all came back together, and everybody talked, and we were able to work that out. Um, it was a good experience for me, you know, in, in Alateen. Um, so, you know, I'm always using these traditions and everything that I do. I have to remember that... There is autonomy, and that God is the trusted servant. And I don't always have to like what I hear, you know. Um, I have to be careful with stuff like that because my sponsor says my head is out to get me, which is true. So, you know, I really try to work the traditions when I'm um, doing service work because of me. <laughs> and because of me, myself, and I, I'm usually the worst person I have to, to deal with in my day. My sponsees are pretty good compared to what goes on up here um i work you know with my you know with my husband whenever we start to do this you know i have to go outside i have to remember who i am i have to go outside because i know what happens between this ear and this ear and it always you know it's not always pretty and um i just go out in the garden and i you know i start to uh the, i put the committee to work in the garden and usually about after a couple of hours, the committee settles down, you know, and I can go back. And, and you know, we always do a lot of prayer with each other, and uh, that seems to work quite a bit in our relationship as well. Um, the 12th tradition, you know, I have to work the 12th tradition a lot. And when I was working with my corporation, when I didn't like the people I was working with, I always had to say, you know, what are you trying to accomplish here, Francis? It doesn't matter if she doesn't like you and or whatever he doesn't like you. You know, is this something, what, what are we trying, what's our common purpose here? You know, principles above personalities. Uh, I have to do this with my sisters. I have four sisters, and I'm the middle child, of course. Um, so, you know, sometimes my sisters, they really get under my skin, you know, because everyone wants to control. You know, there's so much control. We're such good little al and so, you know, I just have to think, you know, dad, 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 we're doing this for dad, you know, <laughs> um, take my personality out of it. And, you know, when I came to the program, the God of my understanding had a personality and it wasn't a pretty one. And um, this last summer, I mean, I've had to think about God a lot. Uh, Billy and Jerry did this. They're a couple from Dallas. They did a traditions workshop and she talked about, you know, principles above personalities with God. I'm like, oh, dear, you know, here we go again, Francis. You're going <laughs> to, this is a new level in recovery. You know, you're going to have to really think about, you know, what you're doing um, when it comes to God. God does, you know, is a loving, caring person in my life. And, um, you know, he doesn't have that personality that I thought he did when, he, when I got here. So I, I just love that. Um, so I went to, we went to this little church up in Colorado last Sunday, 
they had uh, redone a little church up in the back hills and and had a big fiesta because um, it was an old missionary church. And sure enough, the priest was hellfire and damnation. Good Lord. <laughs> I was like, this is 2011. It's not 1950. And um, you know, I kept thinking, you know, it's really wonderful to be in this program because I don't have to agree with what he's saying. But, you know, God is the one that's in charge in this program, not Francis or anyone else. And, um, you know, I just believe the spiritual foundation that, um, you know, if it wasn't for God's grace, we wouldn't be here. And when God's Spirit is working through a conference, you're going to feel it. I have been to conferences where they, they're they a little rough, and I've been to it where I can tell where the committee is just really... That spiritual foundation is there. It makes a successful conference when the Spirit of God is with us. And I am so grateful for the grace of God and graceful. I'm grateful just to be here. Um, I love the history, and I love that uh, that Bill was talking about, you know, read the traditions. I was really grateful to hear that today. So thank you for letting me share today. Thanks, Thank you. I'm an alcoholic, and my name is John. And it was suggested when I arrived at the conference <clears throat> that uh, I come up here and share when the opportunity arose, and here it is. Um, I'm not real well versed with the traditions, um, so I will talk about the one that uh, I'm really grateful for, and that is number three. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. I remember when I uh, arrived at, in Alcoholics Anonymous, I was um, broken and full of fear. And uh, I could have been scared away with a feather. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that because um, sticking around the program has um, changed my life incredibly. Um, I've had an opportunity to become the man that God intended me to be or closer to that. And uh, without that tradition, I don't think I would have. When I got here, I didn't feel like I fit. I would sit in a room filled with people like this, and I would feel completely alone. And it took quite a while um, of the, the fellowship embracing me before I actually felt comfortable here. Um, today, I have a host of friends. One of them's me, and I'm pretty grateful um, that this, this thing has unfolded the way it has for me. Um, the conference has been wonderful for me. Um, my little boy's enjoying it. I'm grateful to be here. And uh, thanks for allowing me the time to follow the suggestion. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.